I miss Fabian because he was very much his own man, he was very independent, he didn't follow fashion trends and he had all these characters who he put a lot of thought into and he did satire but he was always respectful but what I miss most was his warmth, his friendliness. If he met you he'd always ask how you were and he seemed genuinely interested in the answer. Fabian, we'll miss you very much. I just want to say that my special memory of him was his endless ability to love everyone and his courage and his passion to fight hypocrisy. Fabian was, I felt like he was a bit like an older brother to me. He, he knew how to push my buttons, he knew how to make me <laughs> react and he always was mischievous and loved making me react. But I always knew he, his love was undeniable. And one more little story I want to tell is that we used to set up morning tea out there and he would, there would be tables to be carried out and chairs to be carried out every Sunday. And in COVID I did it and I wanted to do it. There was, when I couldn't no longer do it, Fabian did it every week. And he did it because he loved, he loved this. He loved people talking to each other, telling their stories. And, and he was so committed to that. And he also did it because he knew I loved it too. I never met anyone that met him and didn't love him and weren't, um, you know, that love was returned. And he returned love to people that hated him. That was amazing. Always, always. And he taught, me, he taught all of us to feel like that, I think. Well, he certainly taught me to feel like that. I'm Fabian's second sister, middle sister. Could you tell me if you've got any special memories of Fabian? There are, there are so many I could barely list them. All I can say is the time we had in Europe with our family, crammed into a, a comma combi van, six of us, seven with only cat. Uh, Fabian and I became best friends then. If I can ever think of a time when I became best friends with my brother, it was then. Living in a very enclosed space, I really learnt to see how kind and how caring he was and how the smallest thing, the smallest detail was not lost on him. He loved everything we saw, he loved everything we did, especially the churches, of course, and the antiquities. He was a very bad asthmatic when he was a little boy and um, in those days they didn't have puffers, they didn't have all of the new drugs that help asthmatics breathe properly. So he used to take all kinds of different medicine but also people had these strange treatments for him to go through, one of which included him um, it, uh, they sealed up a room uh, in, the, in our house in Eastwood and they put tape all around the windows and pulled up the carpet and they said he can't leave that room now he's got to stay there for three months I think or six months it was something incredible and so he had to live in that room do his school work in that room and no wool or anything everything had to be cotton and the room had to be cleaned every day this was supposed to cure the asthma and we'd be in the backyard because we're one of six and we'd be in the backyard riding our bikes and in the swing in the tree or kicking a ball or playing with the dog. And I just have this memory stuck in my mind of looking up and seeing this little white face watching us through the bedroom window. And that's how I remembered what a struggle it was for him to eventually get out of that bedroom, take up bicycling, and cycle every weekend. He used to cycle for great distances. And he himself took his asthma on and said, I will beat you. And he did. And that's why he still rode bicycles all his life. Do you think 
that is a kind of a metaphor for his life. He was kind of locked away and then he was let out and this sort of wonderful personality, this wonderful witty personality sort of came out. I think that I hadn't thought of that. It is a bit of a metaphor that he took on the impossible. When, um, when everybody else was telling him otherwise, he took on the impossible. My name is Edie Davis. I am an African Australian. I've been in this church for 23 years. This is a church where they have a lot of diversity. Fabian is the best that I've seen in this church. Fabian loved me and my son. In times where nobody wanted us, nobody comes close, so Fabian is there for us. He's been to every birthday party that I celebrated for my son. When my boy got his admission, Fabian went to school to register in the uni with my boy. I love Fabian. Till this day, I am so pained that we lost him. Fabian and I share a lot, a lot in common. We both have pain, we both have been heartbroken. We both have been in places where nobody wants us. Fabian is the best that I've seen in this church. He gives my son present since he was my son's Sunday school teacher. We'll miss him. We'll really miss him. I have to say that I am truly more proud of him and his achievement and what he's done for everybody, for mankind, than anybody I know. He was the most Christian person you would ever meet, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Look, Fabian was a wonderful, loving and lovely friend and member of our community and I've known him for 40 years. Initially in the Gay Liberation Choir in the early 80s, but during many, many activities that we're all involved in together. And today I'm particularly thinking of him singing uh, Thank You Lord for Gay Liberation at Sandy Banks' funeral just over three years ago. That was during the height of COVID. We could only have 10 in the room. He was had a bad cold and was un unable to come down to the south coast. And um, he made a video and sent it to Joe Eccleston, Sandy's long-term partner, and we played that, and a couple of us sang along with it. So I'm particularly thinking of Fabian today. What do you remember about his sense of humour? Oh, look, he was very, very, um, very funny and made fun of people, made fun of institutions and a whole lot of things, but not in a nasty way. It was a, it was a very, very um, clever and kind way. We used to have um, consulate general type functions with paintings that would come into the art gallery. So Fabian was always invited and put a different perspective on the way as, as, as we were all gay. So put a perspective that was different. I, I rarely caught him in a very serious state of mind. And when I did, it was always profoundly wise. You know. How did your family take to him coming out to them? Oh, that, that was really interesting because we, we sent him away. To, we all said goodbye to him at the airport because he was off to St Norbertine's um, Abbey in De Pierre, Wisconsin. And he was in his, in his black satan and his, his novitiate robes. And he went home and then when he told us that he'd come out, he, we went to pick him up at the airport and he arrived in a purple velvet, ja purple velvet jacket and a, and a gorgeous um, shirt and he looked fabulous, long red hair, etc, very curly. He came home looking like Liberace, having left looking like a priest. So that was a really interesting um, time, I think, in his life. And he lived with my husband and I, Michael, um, in those early days for a little while, particularly while he was going through Professor McConaughey's aversion therapy. I met Fabian in 1974 at University of New South Wales in a, a gay group set up by Department of Psychology to promote confidence in homosexuals and Fabian was in the more troubled group. Because he'd had aversion therapy, hadn't he? He'd had aversion therapy with Neil McConaughey who was a gay man at 
University of New South Wales, yeah. Yeah. How did things progress from there? Fabian was trying to work out his situation in relation to Christianity and eventually he was living in Stanmore and um, got involved in the progressive, inclusive Anglo-Catholic part of the church, uh, which was a good accommodation for him. What did you like about his sense of humour? Um, I liked that it was, it was, it was um, generous and it was never judgmental and he had a lot to be angry about but he never felt angry to me and that was uh, uh, quite surprising. Did he ever turn up at church in, in habit? No, I never saw him. Oh, I never okay. saw him in habit at church. I mean, we all, we all knew he liked doing that. And he, oh, and I talked to him about it, but um, yeah, that, he didn't. He didn't turn up in habit at church. But I really enjoyed his, the fact that he could sew. Like it's rare to see from my generation a bloke that can sew well. <laughs> but he he could sew really well. Yeah. And I loved his habits. And I just I remember him saying, a lot of people don't like what I do. And I said, oh, who gives a staff do what you do what you you want to do because it you know just be you and he tried to give that to people too and it was wonderful the way he did that yeah. I knew Fabian in the mid 2000s when I came to Sydney and he was a comrade of mine in Socialist Alliance and I was coming out of the closet and, and going to dance parties and, and marriage equality rallies and Fabian was there giving me a bit of encouragement I remember he he auspiced, he emceed a gallery exhibition that I that I did about coming out and it was very funny and witty and just so supportive of of me as a young LGBTIQ person and then and then activist. So yeah. He used to come into the city of Sydney behind the old town hall and the 23rd floor building where where archives is on the 21st floor. Um, Fabian was an asset to the photos and the knowledge, not just with the gay scene, but with other things, buildings. You know, he did talks for the Pride Walks and all these other things he used to do. He had a great sense of humour. I mean, his characters, you know, Mother Abyss, Mother Inferior, and Monsignor Porca Madonna. How can you not find him having a huge sense of humour? But he was also self-deprecating. He would send himself up, but at the same time he would send the church up, he would send organisations up, but always with respect, kindness and warmth. Fabian will be missed very, very much. He, he, he was... It was wacky. It was whimsical. He thought by not parodying but by you know characterizing things in a slightly different way if you had a sense of humor you could pick up you would pick up on the little side comment that had been made that was a little bit of a happy dig or a little bit of a hmm I wonder why that's the way it is and it was beautiful because it was always his intriguing way yeah, yeah. I think he was always a bit of a performer, yeah. and, a, and he comes from a family with some talent in humour, and he was very creative, and he would really wanted when he was young to be an abbess, as well as a priest, and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence in San Francisco gave him that opportunity, I suppose. Why do you think he was fascinated by religious things? I don't know, he just always was. His bedroom was like that. He, he, he made himself a little kneeler at the end of his bedroom and he would always genuflect and kneel on the kneeler and say his prayers. It was from the very beginning. I don't ever remember him not being like that. Always very reverent. He was fascinated with nun's habits since he was a child and that in his vocation, you know, you could look at books of habits of monks and priests and nuns and you could choose your vocation in relation to your fashion sense. So Fabian thought the Cistercian habit was good 
but he was very attracted to Benedictine choir nuns. What did the family think about him dressing up as a nun? You can imagine, you can imagine, my father wouldn't go to the club, to his club, because he was the sort of man who would feel that he needed to punch somebody who offended his son. But my mother was a much more intelligent woman. She always knew, and she knew that there was someone even more special underneath than we had realised. So my father had a difficulty. But Fabian used to say to them both, look non, that's what we called our mother, a lot of Catholic women would like to have a son who was a priest, but you have a son who's a nun. You're so special. <laughs> Oh, he had so many brilliant characters. I mean, I was very... Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence was something very new to, to me um, as a 27-year-old something queer. And, um, and so he was a pedagogical human and it is no surprise to me that he was a liberation theologist, very devoted liberation theologist. Um, that explains where he was coming from. But yeah, cheeky, queer, wonderful, um, socialist. And I, I also loved every time I saw him, he was on the piano accordion with the Internationale and Bella Chow. So an anti-fascist and a, and a socialist till the end is, and a queer leader extraordinaire. So long live Fabian. His memory will, will live on and we'll celebrate him through our cultural resistance. I think the best time was when we protested for the censorship of Jean-Luc Godard's film Hail Mary at the, at the film festival and we demanded that all censorship powers be given to the sisters as the only reliable representation of community values and that we objected to the film because it portrayed the Blessed Virgin as a heterosexual. Well we were there in habit and we chanted the Queen of Heaven don't pump gas, the Queen of Heaven don't pump gas and then we were attacked by 4,000 Lebanese fascists. Oh, what happened? They started throwing really big candles at us in Gough Whitlam. Gough Whitlam? Yeah. The police said they couldn't protect us and the film festival couldn't protect us. So we had to disrobe and crawl under people's legs away from the fascists. I mean, when I say fascists, I don't use that word loosely. Yeah. They were from um, Kataev, the Falange in Lebanon. Unfortunately, he's gone. He's le left a legacy, which is unbelievable um, and I hope we can continue to do as much as what he did and I'm sure we will. He was very dry um, I really I really loved him and a lot of people found him too dry to, to really get I, but no I think it was a very important part of him. Oh just that I'm gutted that the bug has gone and run off <laughs> what a thing to do. I <laughs> uh, don't know. It's hard to swallow, really. Yeah. I've really been... I've really been moved by it. And distressed. But um, having all these people around works well. Just how delighted I am at how we are surrounded by people that obviously cared for him and loved him, Barry, and I am so grateful for their presence because they just reinforced to me that I'm not the only one who's going to miss him. People will, but I'm not the only one who wanted to celebrate his life. Other people did too.